the way I began to think about museums and museological practices here in the region. Um, I wrote the book over a course of around four years um, during the period that I was teaching here. And I, was, I came here to set up a program in museum studies, museum practice. And the idea was that there were all these new museums were being constructed and we needed to create museum professionals. Um, so that, that was fine. And so we came in with this idea, you know, that this knowledge doesn't exist here. But after being here a very short time, I realized there was very deep museological knowledge here in the region and the museums and collecting practices had existed here for a very, very long time. So I started to examine the processes that were at work and the rhetoric that surrounded this idea of um, the new museums. And I began to understand a little bit more about how the region, the region is engaging with modernity um, through its museological practices and its collecting practices. So, I want to begin with um, a contrasting experience I had in Abu Dhabi um, in 2015, February last year. I went to visit two cultural events that were happening simultaneously. One of them was the Seeing Through Light exhibition that was put on in Sadiat Island in the exhibition space, where exhibitions that, that act as tasters for the planned new museums, the Louvre, the Guggenheim, the Zayed National Museum, um, are presented. And this, this exhibition, Seeing Through Light, was a presentation of works from the Guggenheim collection that will become part of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. So this is an image um, from that exhibition. At the same time, the Casa al Hosn festival was happening. Um, and this was happening downtown. Um, the Casa al Hosn festival, which I know some of you are, are familiar with, is an 11-day festival, annual festival, that includes presentations of traditional activities, craft production, you see the camels here. Um, there's exhibitions associated with it, and it's a very immersive environment. So they actually recreated the various different landscapes of Abu Dhabi. So you could go and there was a sea with real waves and dows, and you could do fishing, um, and you could examine the different animals and the different habitats. And there were lots of demonstrations of um, fishing, woodcutting, traditional um, house construction and so on. And costume participants who would lead you through the event so you could be completely involved in what was happening. So the style and content of these two cultural experiences was completely contrasting. Um, you couldn't have got a greater contrast. So one, an example of the white cube um, modernist space of international museums of the international art world. And one of the Im immersive, interactive, dialogic environment um, that's of regional production. And I wanted to use this as a starting point for my thesis of the twin discourses of cultural production that I see occurring in the region. They are also opposites in terms of content, not only their form. Um, we see modern art as it's a product of Western art history versus poetry, craft, traditional activities of the region. And in rhetorical terms, they represent very specific regional cultural agendas. The Casa al Hosn Festival was described by Sheikh Sultan bin Taknun al Nahyan, chairman of the Abu Dhabi Tourism and Cultural Authority, as and I quote, seamlessly fusing the traditional with the modern. While the Seeing Through Light exhibition was described as, and again I quote, examining light as a primary aesthetic principle in art, the art world, and history. The theme's depth and flexibility has relevance across cultures and time periods by Maisa al Kasimi, the program manager of the Abu Dhabi Tourism and Cultural Authority. The rhetoric of fusing Tradition, the traditional and the modern represents the region's approach to modernity, its stated approach. An agenda, that, an agenda of retaining cultural identity in balance with aspects of a more secular modernity. While the rhetoric of engagement with global art and ideas of the universal as, is, as a method of discursively bridging cultures, bridging the East and the West, bringing people together, is repeatedly emphasized by actors invest, um, investing in and producing the global art projects. So you see the rhetoric presenting these different agendas, these different projects representing these different agendas, and sitting kind of at opposite poles of cultural production in the region. And this is the, the dynamic I want to explore in this talk. Um, 
I will look at two case studies to articulate a little bit more of my argument. So I'm going to look at a, very, uh, a case study that's very familiar to all of us, the Museum of Islamic Art here in Doha. I'm sure all of you have visited. Um, and I also want to look at two examples from Kuwait, which you may be less familiar with, um, though I know that uh, Mohammed Al Sayed, sitting in the front row, is very, very familiar with these two examples. Uh, one of them is the Saif Malzouk Al Shamlan Museum, and the other one is Beit Al Uthman, another uh, local museum, um, as examples of regional museological production. So, my central thesis, just to um, reiterate, is that local and international cultural productions in the sphere of museums exist simultaneously, and each is a product of the regional engagement with globalization processes, and each articulates an, aspects of, an aspect of the region's contemporary identity. So, this sounds very simple and very binary. Um, and it's almost deliberately so in the way I'm presenting it today. Because obviously you've got a spectrum of activities and which engage in different ways with aspects of modernity and globalization. But I just wanted to lay out almost like the furthest post of these so we can then frame the activities, what's happening in between. One of the things I wanted to say uh, um, about the arguments of globalization is when you look at the globalization processes from a certain perspective. These are, are seen as, there are many ways that these are interpreted, but often you get this idea of hybridity emerging in discussions of globalization. The globali globalization results in hybrid practices, the bringing together of different ways of, um, dem of carrying out certain activities or ways uh, or philosophies. Um, writers um, and thinkers within the region have often been very, very negative about globalization because if you're, there's this idea that it's seen as cultural attack, and there's a particular word that is used in the literature, a particular Arabic word that talks about cultural attack, um, and this desire to protect regional culture from cultural attack, from being pushed out of the way by globalization, which is regarded as synonymous with westernization. So we don't want that to happen, that's the feeling. So sometimes when I talk about the local and the global, the Western versus what's happening here. It can seem too simplistic. And, but when you look at it from the inside, that is exactly how it's set up. Um, so there's a resistance to many of these different cultural forms coming in. So just to make the position clear on that. Um, so the new museums have attracted a huge amount of media attention, which has resulted in a misconception amongst some commentators that local muse museological practices do not exist. And the more generally, the Arabian Peninsula is a tabula rasa. You hear this all the time. There's nothing here. Um, so we need to bring in the museums. Um, and it, in fact, there's a discourse that says that the region needs these museums. It needs to be civilized through these museums coming in, which is a very pejorative discourse when you start to deconstruct it. The idea is there is no culture here. People have no culture here. We need to bring these museums to civilize them. However, um, I would argue that engagement with Western style museums was and is a strategic choice by the ruling families and elite actors, regarded initially as a useful technology to preserve recently discovered archeological collections in the 1950s and 60s, then following independence as a tool in the construction of the nation and the leg legitimization of the ruling family and the narration of consistent historical narratives. And finally, more recently, as a means of branding nations and gaining symbolic global power through accessing cultural cap capital. So these museums are not a necessity, but they are a desire. They're, they're gonna serve a very particular purpose. It's the global art projects that have attracted the gaze of the world. In December 2008, the Museum of Islamic Art opened, the first of the new international or global museum projects, drawing extensively on Western paradigms of um, museological expertise. At the moment, there's a number of large museum projects um, that are under construction. This is the, obviously the National Museum of Qatar. Um, I had a no note here saying due to open in, and then I thought I would just leave that blank because who knows. Um, Sadiat Island, um, with its suite of different proposed museums. We're looking at renderings here, of course, because these don't really exist. 
Um, the Louvre at Abu Dhabi up here, the dome, um, the Zayed National Museum here, and the Guggenheim over in the far corner. The Louvre is the closest to opening at the moment. And then the King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture in Saudi Arabia. Signifying an attempt at shifting global cultural centers, not just within the Arab world, but in relation to the West, and demonstrating a fluent understanding of Western cultural values, the emphasis on material culture, on the prestige of the museum. These projects all share a number of characteristics. Spectacular architecture, world-class co collections, utilization of universal approaches to art and history, a top-down approach to cultural management, and intense international speculation around their significance, relevance, and sustainability. They're the focus of the West's envious and critical gaze because we can't afford these projects anymore. And the region, however, is far from being a tabula rasa. It's rich in the kind of heritage that orthodox Western heritage models struggle to accommodate. Intangible, performative, embodied. For example, orally performed um, poetry is hugely significant. This makes its mobilization by the state less advantageous at an international level in terms of acquiring global prestige. Because it, not only is it hard to place inside a museum, its value is not understood outside the region. You can't share that value. It's very hard to communicate through that value. But it's effective at a national level as a means of winning the support of the population through shapely patronage and association. So the state utilizes these, cult these elements of culture. Support of traditional heritage act activities also demonstrates state protection of local culture from the perceived dangers of globalization and its associations with secular Western culture, counterbalancing state investment in aspects of Western culture, such as the new museum. So you see a balancing act going on all the time in the way that um, the states are managing their cultural production. I just want, this is a nice picture of camels. Um, these regional heritage activities, such as camel racing and poetry performance, or the local heritage festivals that are popular across the region, tend to occur below the radar of external observers and are almost entirely absent from um, international media coverage creating this idea of the tabula rasa. Within this category of cultural production are the private collections and museums which have proliferated across the region in response to the changing uh, lifestyles brought about by the coming of oil. And this anxiety about the change that has, this has resulted in these collections have also become a response to the authorized histories shown in the new national museums, um, which are regarded by some as unrepresentative. The private museums are spaces of representation for indiv individuals, families, and communities that may or may not align with the state narratives. A very interesting example of this is the Sheikh Faisal bin Qasim Al Thani Museum here in Doha, which has a fascinating collection representing very personal interests. And when you talk to Sheikh Faisal, he tells you repeatedly about how his museum tells a true history, which is different from the history, the state histories, or the histories written by um, foreign writers. So let's touch briefly on one of my case studies, which is the Museum of Islamic Art. So this opened in 2008 in this building designed by I.M. Pei. Um, the history of this building itself is an example of the shift to engaging with a more kind of global perspective. So the architect who won the original um, competition for the building was a Jordanian architect who's very well known across the Middle East. Um, and then the building was then given to IMP to design. So you've got this shift from someone who might be known regionally um, to someone who's kind of spectacularly well known. So that immediately draws attention. So IMP designed this building based on the um, fountain in the Ibn Tulun Mosque in, in Cairo. It's a very well-known story. The architecture is extraordinarily well-known about this building. And if you Google um, the Museum of Islamic Art, you'll get thousands of pictures of the building, but very few of the collections inside or the, acti or the associated activities. An assessment for me must begin with 
a look at the international media response to its opening because it was this media response that locked in many of the ideas, the discourse around the new museums in the region. It was a spectacular event. Um, rock stars were invited, famous artists were invited and the press coverage was huge and the articles that were written on the back of this opening um, are cited repeatedly when people write about museums in the region. It really did set set the discourse in place. This news stories debated how and why this tiny Arabian Peninsula state had created a museum of such magnificence. A museum that presented the Islamic world to the Western discipline of Islamic art history so perfectly. It was an exact version of the acceptable Islamic world, disconnected from religion and politics. Critics also asked how relevant was such a museum to the local community, a question still asked of the new international museums, given the dominance of Westerners in their production and operation. So how does MIA communicate with its audiences, and who are they? So this is a view of one of the galleries. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. Um, these were designed by the French design company, company Wilmot & Associates, and they have an aesthetic of formal minimalism. Boutique lighting, luxurious materials. It's like a luxury hotel. It's, there are beautiful spaces to be inside. The objects are spotlit, sitting individually in cases so you can have that individual aesthetic communion with each object. There's almost no information, tiny labels that tell you it's a jar or um, a horse. Um, and that's it. According to Oliver Watson, the director of the, of the museum at the time of opening, this approach, is, and I quote um, from his own reflections on this museum, it was a style of gallery seen as the most old-fashioned, least helpful to the uninitiated, most austere and intimidating. Presentation in the grand individual masterpiece mode. He said, this was a deliberate choice through the belief that if you want to engage people in ideas and promote understanding, this idea of intercultural understanding through works of art, the key factor is the visual impact of those objects. The Western-centric nature of this approach has been pointed out by Wendy Shaw, scholar of modernity, colonialism, and art in the Islamic world, who characterizes Islamic art history as viewing Islam as a cultural rather than a religious product. Um, created, and I quote, largely, largely through epistemological structures grounded in Western modes of perception. She points out that the notions of art and beauty inherent in museums of Islamic art do not derive from the cultural background of the objects on display. Um, and I quote, but from a framework of European academic and museum traditions that are embedded in a particular narrative of historical progress that located the birth of civilization in the East, but its end and future in Europe. And that's something to think about when we think about the, how these ideas are then brought back into the region and we analyze what's happening here. She argues that the context for the creation of these collections bears little relationship to the cultural and political transformations of the Islamic world and its relationship to the West in recent decades. So this is the context that shaped Mia's development into a beautiful box of art and beauty formed by a Western-style vision producing an art museum of absolute orthodoxy. Arguably, local relevance was not the driving agenda. So when we look at this very Western-style museum, um, and people say, but what is the connection to the local audience? How do they engage with this? How, what are they taking away from this? Um, and what I would say to that is that wasn't the point. Um, this is now changing. So there's now a program to try to um, engage uh, more diverse audiences into the museum. But when it was first drafted up, this vision for this museum, um, the agenda was entirely different. So Mia can be seen, um, I would say, as a masterstroke of cultural diplomacy and an example of regional agency in a globalized world, utilizing an existing medium of Western communication, the museum, to attempt to change the discourse from within, the discourse on the Islamic world. For example, Islam, which profoundly shapes the region and the nature of its modernity, receives mention in international media in primarily the pejorative sense. And I went through the newspapers at the time and looked at what they were saying and the way that um, the men how Islam was cast. I also went through books on um, all the kind of standard texts on globalization and looked at how Islam appeared in those texts as well. 
and it was mostly in chapters called things like jihad, um, but nothing positive, no real understanding of Islamic globalization and the long history of that tradition. The presentation of the Muslim world is clearly understood within the region. As Her, as Her Excellency Sheikha Mayasa, chairperson of Qatar Museums, has stated, the agenda of the state cultural projects is to link Qatari culture to, to transnational networks of visual culture and attempt to create international and intercultural dialogue. Um, the same thing as we heard about the Guggenheim. More broadly, cultural commentators and political scientists have characterized the cultural projects as part of an apparently well thought out strategy of influencing the world to its advantage and as a mode of diplomatic communication with Europe and the US necessary, necessary for defense reasons to open those connections and maintain and sustain um, those networks through a familiar form of communication. Yeah, this museum has been extremely successful as an artifact of cultural diplomacy. It communicates this message of familiarity to the Western world, engaging with Western modernity in its form and content on the West's terms. But this doesn't mean that's everything that's going on here. This is an agenda, um, and it's very successful. I want to move now to look at the second case study. Um, so we're going to move to Kuwait to show the flip side of what's happening in the region. I'm just going to leave. This is the Dixon uh, House Cultural Center, which is not an example of um, what I'm talking about, but I just want to leave it up as a uh, drop of some examples that's that of some museums in Kuwait. So Arabian Peninsula regional traditional heritage production and performance operates along a spectrum ranging from fully state managed and integral to supporting the political structure to individual initiatives that may or may not align with state agendas. And I've talked about poetry performances, camel racing, falconry, and so on, and talked about how these have been revived as symbolic practices um, that support the state. Poetry um, is, is central here, and I think we're all aware of Millions Poet and just how successful um, that program is. There's been much discussion about the political expe the, the expediency of the state utilizing these different practices um, so that they're seen as supporting their people. Um, Suleiman Khalaf, the UAE-based anthropologist, has described these activities as giving new meaning, rhetoric, and direction. These, in turn, are communicated through the state-controlled media to celebrate the UAE, for example, as an imagined political community, um, the Anderson phrase. It also gives legitimacy to the sheikhs as national leaders who are guiding their people in praiseworthy ways. So we see this um, nationalization of local heritage, regional heritage practices, to the extent of having the Zayed National Museum built in the form of, of falcon wings, um, because this falconry has been taken on as symbolic of the state um, in the UAE. If we move to Kuwait in particular, we see something quite different happening because there has been very little um, activity in terms of top-down top management of um, heritage and museums in recent years. It's, partly this has been for financial reasons, um, the 1980s Sukarmanic stock market crash, falling oil prices, which we're all experiencing, the Iran-Iraq war, and of course, with Kuwait, the enormous cost of reconstructing Kuwait following the invasion of 1990-1991. So the figure given in uh, 1994-5 fiscal year was $66.7 billion. So therefore, building museums was not a priority. They also don't have an international tourism industry or an agenda to have one. So, and they also don't have the same post-oil diversification agenda that the other states use to frame their, their investment in new museums. There's a number of established state-run museums, and um, this is one of them. So this is the house of the, political, of the British political <coughs> resident. Um, this is the Museum of Modern Art, again, a very kind of, it's a, it's a locally produced museum, but in a sort of sits in that spectrum between um, one end and the other. Um, they're very quiet, don't, don't often see very many people here. Um, the National Museum of Kuwait was damaged um, in the invasion. It's still awaiting to be uh, properly reconstructed. Though you can visit the Heritage um, House part of that and see dioramas of traditional life. Kuwait has a strong seafaring tradition, so there's various festivals that celebrate this, um, this aspect. 
Um, but let's move on to look at some of the museums that I think are best representative of cultural practices um, in Kuwait. So there's Mohammed in that image there, just to make you famous. Um, so Mohammed al Sayyid, who was hugely helpful in allowing me to find out more about these different museums, visit them, fantastic network of people. Um, so we're here in the photographic collection of Saif Mazuk al-Shamlan, and his, um, also some, his, his son is here, other members of the family. Um, so this is in Diwaniya. It's the, the traditional narrow room. Um, you can see the traditional um, cushions on the floor and then the photographs all over the walls. And I always like this photo because people say to me, oh, no one likes to collect in the region. And then I show them this and say, well, what do you make of that then? That's just one small element of one person's collection. His main museum is this one. So again, it's a diwanir. Um, it's, you can see the building at the bottom there, a traditional coral stone house. Um, and then inside, this incredibly rich display of objects, um, which includes all the kind of key elements that you find in regional, regional collections. So you find weaponry, so you can see the rifles at the end, all of the photographs here that connect to the, to, um, the family. Um, to, to Saif himself and his interactions with various people. Um, you see this very, very carefully organized displays in the niches. And at the other end of the room, which I'll, I think I have it on a later slide, you see the chests from um, the Indian chests um, that many of these people have, and gramophones and old radios. So all the key elements of classic collections of the region are represented in this incredibly rich looking room where there's almost too much to take in. So when you visit this, this museum, and it's called a museum, there are, there's no interpretation, there's no labels, there's, there's nothing there to tell you what's going on. But what you do have there is uh, members of the Al Shamlan family who will tell you about everything here. So it's very dialogic. Your experience of this museum is you learn through communicating, so you, and you ask questions, and you touch, and you're, it's a completely immersive environment. So it's the opposite of what we might understand by a Western-style museum. So the value of this and similar collections as, is, lies in who the owner is and their connection to their society. So that's how you access um, the meaning of these collections. And you can sit and talk for hours about any element um, in this room. They also act as a memorialization of local and regional history um, in a way that the other, the more, I suppose, traditional Western style museums fail to do. They're very personal. It's very easy to relate to the events that are documented through these collections. And their value is recognized. It's by their owners, of course, who feel a sense of urgency to protect these collections and feel that these new museums coming in are creating a history that is, does not encompass the experiences um, embodied and performed in these rooms and represented by these rooms. So as a means to safeguard and validate these collections and their historical consequence, some of them are beginning to be institutionalized through projects such as Beit Al Othman, which is another museum in Kuwait. It's a private heritage museum. Um, and it offers an example of a museum concerned with Kuwaiti socio-economic history of recent times. So what you find is in many of the sort of the older national museums, um, and it's hard to tell with the new national museums because none of them are ready. The Oman Museum is just about to open. I think you can actually visit now. Um, what you find is missing is the recent history. So you have archaeology, and then you have pre-oil pre lifestyles, and then you have now. But what happened in between? What, what was life like in that period of development and change? Um, and you find quite a reductive narrative being told, which is very closely linked to legitimization and this sense of celebration. It's teleological. We got where we are today, so we're just going to tell a narrow story that documents that. And there's a sense of alienation amongst many people with those narratives. And so people have started to construct, at least in Kuwait, um, where there's more freedom to do this kind of thing, 
their own documentation of the past. Ah, yeah, this is an image from um, Seyf Mazuk al Shamlan's museum with the Kuwaiti chest, sorry, the Indian chests, and then the gramophones and so on. Um, and then this is Beit al Uthman. I'll just come on to this, which I think is brilliant. Um, so these museums are now being placed into, in a more kind of institutionalized form, in villas. Um, in suburban areas which are very easy to access, not downtown where the new museums are, where people don't live, but just where people do live. Um, the museum concerns itself with subjects that range from those typically addressed in standard national museums and state heritage festivals, seafaring, pearling, Bedouin lifeways, and so on. But also it deals with other subjects. So here we find the history of Kuwait airline, Airways established in 1954. Um, with these mannequins in a reconstructed part of a plane. Um, and the Drama Museum, which is a room telling the history of Kuwait's involvement with drama, which many people may not be aware of, particularly if you're from outside the region. Many of the displays are installed in small rooms surrounding the courtyards that reconstruct what they represent. So a barber shop, a corner shop, a bedroom, a wedding night. The subjects displayed portray a sophisticated, creative, and bohemian society. For example, an artist's room is reconstructed. The contrast with the traditional, idealized, very generic pre-oil, pre-modern dioramas that you find in the, in the national museums, the older national museums. They also offer an insight into the increasing conservatism prevalent from the 1980s and sub subsequent to the Iraqi invasion of 1990. So we see a much more nuanced um, narrative of Kuwait's recent history. One of the, and one of the things I really like is here is Kuwaiti Airlines from the 1970s, then we move to the 1980s, and over time, the costumes become more enveloping. So people may not realize that you know, in the 1960s, 1970s, Kuwait was a very bohemian, very open society. It was a really fun place to be. Um, if you look up Kuwaiti pop groups from that period, they're fantastic. So the conservatism came in much more recently. Um, and it's, it's not that long ago that things were very, very different. In the center of Beit al-Othman is a large courtyard where you can sit and take refreshments and you can talk to the heritage team who are volunteers who run the museum. So this revives the traditional experience of the Diwaniya or the Majlis. Um, the reception room of the house where these collections were traditionally gathered as a place of dialogue and sharing of knowledge. So, this is a quote from Mayal Nakib's book, uh, short story, The Hidden Light of Objects, which is in a story collection called The Hidden Light of Objects. So the Kuwait of the dioramic memories um, in this museum is vibrant, cosmopolitan, reminiscent of Beirut as the Paris of the Middle East before the Civil War, a vanished place also absent from reductive Western discourses that fail to imagine Kuwait beyond religious conservatism, which is an apprehension partly based on the fact that the state is dry, um, with strong conflict associations, so a very negative image. In 2014, um, Kuwaiti-American author Mayal Nakib's collection of short stories won the Edinburgh International Book Award. Um, it was described as being melancholy yet full of hope. Um, they add up to a delicately devastating portrait of the Middle East. And I see these stories as the counterpoint to museums such as Beit al-Othman, which also narrate this recent history and the recent changes. They offer an elegiac account of a country in a region transformed by recent events that people are still coming to terms with. The impact of the discovery of oil, the Iraq invasion um, and occupation, these have ruptured the present from the past in a very dramatic way. The stories and the displays in Beit al-Othman reveal how, also are revealing how the international media has elided from the Western gaze, this version, this Kuwait, this cosmopolitan, this avant-garde Kuwait. And when you read these stories, they start off quite you know, light, and by the end of it, you're just on the floor, absolutely devastated by this sense of loss and this sense of nostalgia that pervades the stories. Um, one of the things she, things she writes about is the coming of oil and how this is seen as both a good and a bad thing because of the 
the changes it wrought in traditional society. Um, and then obviously you had the invasion and then how much that transformed society as well. So he talks about this, saying there is no going back. We look to the past, we cannot go back. Um, so nothing, not a thing went back to the way it has been. New people in the country, new food, new habits, new language. Suddenly women swathed in on, ominous, ominous black hoods, which hadn't been the case before. One year can blot out the past. So these very dramatic recent transformations. So Beit al Othman also captures that sense as you move around the different spaces that preserve this very recent history. And people talk to you about it, and you, you understand the significance. So to conclude, I want to just finish with the brief mention of one other museum. This is um, the Beit al Banat in the Deira area of Dubai, the Women's Museum. At the entrance to the museum, you see this display of photographs and objects a watch, a couple of watches, a pen, some glasses, and a little label that tells you who they belong to, Mr. Ahmed al-Hashimi. The photographs are of people who live in and around the museum. They've been donated to the museum. Um, and they date back up to around 80 years, up to very, very recent images. And again, you can see a change. You can see how society has changed over this time. And I was talking to the director, Dr. Rafia, and she said that people come in all the time to comment on these photographs and say, I know that person, that's my uncle, that's, you know, whoever. And to, you know, stop and to talk and to share their stories. For me, these photographs and the display that came with them of these personal objects, which may not look significant, they may not be museum objects in another kind of museum, but they're of huge value to the local um, community. They were very reminiscent of the Museum of Innocence in Istanbul, which was the museum created um, by the author Orhan Pamuk um, as the material realization of his novel of the same name. And it captures through everyday objects the lives of the protagonists in the novel, as well as reflecting on the social and cultural transformations of Istanbul as it engaged with Western modernity during the 1970s and 1980s. The novel's main protagonist, Kamal, obsessively collects objects that belong to Fusun, the young woman he, woman, woman he loves but cannot marry, for class reasons, because of social change as well. Objects that also represent broader trends in sociocultural transformation. The sense of loss and nostalgia links to the personal, the, links the personal story to the wider transformations that Istanbul was undergoing at the time. And it's the same impulse that has driven many people to collect and preserve objects connected to their lived experience in the Arabian Peninsula as it undergoes rapid change and development and negotiates its own relationship with modernity. This approach to museums and collecting in the Arabian Peninsula contrasts with the spectacular new art museums that dominate media attention. But these are extraordinary conceits, so I'm not casting one as good, one as bad. They're simply... Things that are happening simultaneously, and we need to have a more holistic vision of every element of museological production in the region. So I'd say these, these fabulous new museums should be celebrated for the spectacularization of an existing form made possible by the wealth in the region. Um, their moment, they mark a moment in time, and mark, they're markers of a paradigm shift in the utilization of Western culture, if not a shift in cultural form. And they are products of regional geopolitics, geopolit globalization, capitalism. While these spectacular projects have dazzled so many outside observers that they fail to see the rich texture of the heritage activities that fall outside standard Western pres preservation taxonomies, such as poetry and so on, it is these that then articulate significant regional concerns and concepts of time and the past while their form means that they are fully available only to those who share similar histories and maybe not available to all of us in this room. They are significant repositories of memory and experience that cannot be narrated in the national or global spaces for social, political, or disciplinary region, reasons. So my central thesis has been and is that local and international cultural production in the sphere of museums exists simultaneously each a project of the regional engagement with globalization processes, and each articulating an aspect of the region's contemporary identity. And I hope that some of the examples here illustrate elements of this argument, and they've been deliberately 
strongly contrasted to sit at either end of that argument. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed seeing some of these um, images today and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.